Um, so I'm I'm um, trained as an aerospace engineer, um, but as you'll see, my research is somewhere between aerospace engineering, um, computational mathematics, and uh, computational science. Um, I think aerospace engineering is a very exciting field, and it's always been an exciting field. And I'm sure that for many of you, uh, developments in aerospace maybe inspired you to pursue a career in engineering. Uh, so what are some of the reasons why I say there's never been a more exciting time? Well, one is um, we will see humans uh, back on the moon in our life lifetime, for sure you guys will. Um, and that is, I think, by itself really exciting also to think that many of us as engineers may even contribute to making that happen. Um, second is a revolution in autonomous vehicles and the prospect of um, autonomous vehicles, of drones, changing the way that potentially we, um, we, we live our everyday lives. Um, so this is something that's of interest to me and we have a new project starting in the fall with NASA looking at autonomous vehicles for cargo delivery. So I don't know, I'm guessing that Amazon is probably as big in the UK as it is in the US and it's gotten us through this pan pandemic, right? Where you can pick up your phone and at the touch of a button, have whatever you need delivered to your front door. So imagine a future where autonomous drones play some role in bringing those packages um, from the factories across the world and, and ultimately to your, to your front door. I think that's really exciting. And then even further out to think about urban air mobility and the prospect of things like air taxis that are carrying us as humans. And then uh, a third area that's uh, really exciting is what's going on in space more generally. Um, this picture of astrograph, this is from my colleague at uh, UT Austin, uh, Murray Bajar, who's one of the world's leading experts on um, modeling things in space, so space junk, thinking about all the satellites and uh, you know, other things that are being put into space, about the complexity of that problem um, from a political um, standpoint, but also what it enables from a technological and economic standpoint. And I um, think that over the next decade and longer, we're gonna see tremendously more use of space. And, and it, again, it's gonna be shaping the world in which we, we live in. So lots going on in aerospace engineering and uh, computational engineering is playing a key role in helping us to imagine the future. And so, as I said, I'm someone who really sits in between uh, aerospace and, and computation. So uh, before I talk about some of my work in Digital Twins, um, I wanted to, to share a little bit of a historical um, perspective. And in particular, um, talk about the, um, just a little bit of the history of the Wright brothers and, and their development. And I think, um, you know, it's really easy to look at people like the Wright brothers and think about how amazing they were, which they were, and also think that you know, none of us are capable of anything like that. Um, and I also, you know, I remember when I was young, I used to think that people were sort of born being incredible designers or born with incredible you know, skills at, at being able to build things. And um, you know, maybe that's true in some part, but the reality is that those skills are, can all be learned and are all taught. And in fact, these are the kinds of skills that you're you're being taught in your degree program at, at Cambridge. And the Wright brothers history, I think is a really good example to look to. So if you don't know the story of the Wright brothers, I really encourage you to go and dig up some of the history. And um, there's a lot of lessons learned there. So first of all, where did they start? They started off by being very careful to study what had already been done. So the people like Kaylee and Langley and Lilienthal that came before them. And again, when, as we as researchers are thinking about difficult problems, we don't ever start with a blank sheet of paper we always have to think about what's been done, what uh, has worked, and maybe what's importantly, what hasn't worked. So from there, they identified the most difficult part of the problem. And does anybody know what, what they identified to be the, the most difficult part of the problem? And I'll just give you a clue. It's not, was not generating the lift to get into the air. Does anybody know what the big challenge was? You can just unmute yourself and shout it out. Was it the wings snapping, like structural problem? It was not structural. It wasn't aero, it wasn't structural. What else, what else is left? Stability. Yeah, stability and control. 
So uh, they identified that basically control was the most difficult part of the problem. They could get into the air, but then having controlled flight, um, and of course the, the wing snapping and the structure comes when you crash. <laughs> so that but sort of becomes a consequence. So they identified sort of the, you know, again, the most difficult part of the problem, and then they had to innovate, right? They had to come up with a novel solution to address that problem. And for the Wright brothers, that was the idea of wing warping. So changing the shape of the wing to affect control. So again, you know, everything I'm saying might apply to a research problem that, that you would be doing today, more than a century, century, a century later. So then what did they do? They had the background, the literature review, um, the most difficult part of the problem, their novel solution. So now what? Now it's a uh, process of systematic test, failing, recording, learning, trying again, and uh, really moving towards a viable solution. And so the, the pictures that you see here um, depict some of those. So you see in 1900, that was their first test aircraft, which had a 17 foot wingspan. So it was pretty small. You can see the canard there at the front. Um, so you might know that canards play an interesting role in changing the, the aerodynamic and the stability uh, characteristics of, a, of an aircraft. And that flew as a piloted glider. Um, with that small initial vehicle, they were able to demonstrate roll control. So controlling the roll dynamics of the aircraft using the wing warping. So it was kind of like the proof of concept of their strategy. Um, then you see in 1901, a larger aircraft. So now it's bigger because uh, they want more lift to be able to carry a pilot in lighter wings. Um, so this one's about a hundred pounds. And this one, this aircraft, uh, so history tells us, did not perform as well as expected. So they didn't get the results from the flight test they were expecting, at which point they began to question the aerodynamic data and um, again, you can find a lot of this information online. The Wright brothers then went and built their own wind tunnel. So they actually built their own wind tunnel and they tested hundreds of wings and airfoil sections and they recorded everything and they compiled tables of uh, aerodynamic data. So they really kind of went back literally to the, to the drawing board. Then in uh, 1902, they had the new aircraft that was based on that new data. And you can see it's getting bigger. Um, this one's got a movable rudder on it. You can just see it at the back there, the movable rudder. So they're moving now towards a more sophisticated control system. And so at this point, they basically have everything except for the propulsion system. And you can see that now in the 1903 one where they built their own engines and propellers. And uh, by the way, this, this aircraft was about 700 pounds. So, um, so a lot bigger than the 100 pounds that they, or the 50 pounds that they, they started off with. So again, what are the lessons learned here? You know, just imagine being the first person, the first people to achieve powered flight. And I have to throw in here because I'm from New Zealand that that's debated in New Zealand because um, there are people who claim that um, Richard Pierce in the South Island of New Zealand actually did it earlier. But nonetheless, to, to make such a mark in history, um, you don't just sort of wake up and do it, right? There's a systematic process. And this is what we as engineers do. We look at um, difficult problems in the world around us. We look at what's been done before, we identify where the sticky points are, we uh, come up with novel ideas, often they don't work, we test them, we learn from our mistakes, and we kind of proceed through until, um, until one day we, we have a, a, a great success. Okay, so um, that's a historical perspective. Now, of course, today, 100 years on, um, aircraft are very different. Um, the challenges are different. Aircraft are incredibly complex. And, uh, you know, again, you might know that an aircraft now is not designed and built by two people, but by teams of thousands of people who are distributed all over the world. Uh, aircraft have a very complex life cycle. So the, the points shown here are what we refer to as the life cycle of an aircraft from its concept through its design, different stages of design, manufacturing, operation, post-life, and then ultimately retirement. And for a commercial aircraft, for something like a Boeing 777, this life cycle is decades, decades and decades. Um, so I always, I, I have to say the um, 747 is one of my favorite uh, commercial aircraft. And to think that the 747s that are still flying today were designed back in the 1970s, it's just sort of remarkable, right? To think about that long life cycle and to think that the aircraft that we're designing today will be flying in the years 2030, 2040, and just imagine what the, what the world might look like then. 
So um, things have changed. Um, I'm going to talk today a lot about how uh, computational models and computers and simulations have changed the way we can think about modeling and designing aircraft. And uh, you know, there's a ton to talk about there, and this is what a lot of my research focuses on. Um, today, I'm going to talk about just one idea, um, which uh, which which we're working on, and which uh, is getting a lot of attention in the um, in the world, and that's the idea of a digital twin. So, what is a digital twin? You can see here a definition that comes from AIAA. AIAA is the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So, a digital twin is a set of virtual information constructs that mimics the structure, context, and behavior of an individual or a unique physical asset, is dynamically updated with data from the physical twin throughout its life cycle and informs decisions that realize value. Okay, so what's a digital twin? It's the virtual model, set of computational models of a system. And how is it different to the models that engineers have been using for decades? It's different in a few key ways. One is, this is not a generic model, so it's not a model of a 777 or a model of um, an F-35. It's a, it's a model of one particular aircraft, one particular tail number. Um, the second thing is that it's dynamically updated, so it's a, not a model that you create once and then you're done and it's static, but it's a living model that is going to follow the physical twin through its life cycle and is going to acquire data from the physical twin and then the model is going to be dynamically updated uh, to reflect how the physical twin changes as the physical twin moves from concept to design to manufacturing and then changes in operation. And then lastly, you can see um, that it's going to play a big role in, in informing decisions. So um, I think this is a, a really neat idea. Um, and um, while, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the history in a second, while the idea has its roots in aerospace, if you look uh, today and you Google digital twins, you'll see people talking about digital twins in all kinds of fields. So especially in medicine, um, people are talking about digital twins to aid in um, personalized medicine. And I have to tell you, I would love one day to have a digital twin of myself that it could wake up in the morning, sort of plug in my data and it could tell me it's time to go for a run or uh, don't, don't eat that donut or uh, you know, give, us, give us personalized um, data-driven information that can guide our decisions for our health. So digital twins in medicine, uh, people are talking about digital twins of the entire planet to guide, guide decision-making around things like climate change, um, digital twins of buildings. We were just talking about the infrastructure in Austin falling apart um, during our, our unexpected winter storm. So imagine digital twins of bridges and water pipes and you know all the infrastructure in a, in a city uh, and many, many examples. So again, um, I think history is, is really um, interesting here. And the, the term digital twin was coined uh, by NASA about a decade ago in, in uh, 2010. But the idea is much older and many people actually point to the Apollo program as being the first place where this idea was put into practice. And uh, the way it was put into practice is that when NASA were launching the Apollo spacecraft, they would keep a simulator on the ground at Mission Control in Houston, and the simulator would kind of track what was going on with the physical spacecraft that was up in space. And of course, this became uh, very relevant in the Apollo 13 mission. So have you guys seen the movie? Yeah. Um, so in Apollo 13, what happened? There was an explosion in the ox oxygen tanks um, and the main engine of the spacecraft got, um, got badly damaged. So now you have a damaged, a crippled spacecraft stuck up in space. And so again, you know, the, the historical record is that NASA could take the data from the crippled physical spacecraft, the physical twin, feed it into the simulators that were on the ground, the digital twin, now the digital twin has been dynamically updated uh, to reflect the change conditions of the, the physical spacecraft. And now these simulators can be used and were used to run the what-if scenarios and to inform the decisions that ultimately brought the astronauts back home. So again, that's a, um, I think a really compelling example of just how um, valuable it can be to have this asset-specific, dynamically updated uh, digital twin to drive decisions. And of course, again, we have to remember this happened in 1970. 
and um, think about the computing power and even the data that uh, NASA had available to them, it's a reminder that our computational models don't have to be perfect to actually be really valuable in helping us drive good, good decisions. Okay, so um, let's come back to the year 2021 and uh, think about what digital twins need um, today or what the opportunities are, because clearly we have a lot more computational power. We have a lot more sophisticated models so we can simulate many things about engineering systems. And of course, we have a lot more data. We have incredible sensor technology that's uh, uh, on board our vehicles and in our manufacturing processes. So digital twins need a lot of computational science. And you notice I use the phrase, the, the term computational science. It's not the same thing as computer science. Computational science is an interdisciplinary field that uses mathematics, uh, mathematical modeling advanced, and advanced computing to understand and solve complex problems. And again, this is the field that's at the core of the Odin Institute that I direct at UT Austin. So why, how is computational science different to computer science? You know, really the key is this idea of mathematical models. And what are mathematical models? So um, these are the things that you've been seeing in your engineering classes, the Navier-Stokes equations that help us predict how the flow over an aircraft wing will, will be under different conditions, or the um, equations of linear elasticity that let you predict how a structure is going to respond under loading. So all the, the governing laws of nature that we we write down as mathematical models, as um, systems of differential equations, and then solving those with advanced computing to, uh, again, understand and drive, drive decisions. And so as I go through uh, my talk, you're going to see these kinds of ideas popping up. So physics-based models, these PDE models, um, the theory of inverse problems, uncertainty quantification, surrogate modeling and reduced order modeling, scientific machine learning, scalable algorithms, you're going to see all these sort of different pieces popping up in what I show you with uh, the way that we approach uh, creating a digital twin. And uh, these things here, these are kind of the, the, the core uh, methodological topics of, that my research group works on. All right, so um, I'm going to now transition into kind of the technical part and talking to you, showing you how we build a model of a, of a digital twin, how we define it and um, then how we are going to update it and how we're going to use it for decisions. But before I do that, let me just pause and see um, if anyone wants to pop in and ask a question. There's nothing in the chat. Anyone want to ask a question? Nope. All right. So, uh, so let's go ahead and talk about how we can think about um, how we can think about defining, mathematically defining a digital twin, building it, updating it, and then deploying it. And uh, so first I'm, I'm gonna, well, I can't see you guys unless you got your videos off, but um, you guys um, take classes in controls, controls and dynamics um, mostly, right? And in, in certainly in mechanical engineering and aero. Yeah, yeah, that's very upholstery. Good. I taught um, I taught controls and signals and systems for like I don't know 16 years at MIT. It's my favorite subject to teach. So you're going to see um, a lot of uh, terms and language that hopefully will be familiar to you because they're the kinds of things you will have seen in your controls and, and dynamics class. And then hopefully you're going to see just how powerful these ideas are and um, again how they they play a role in, in building these models. All right. So we're going to first of all define the elements of a digital twin. And the first thing we're going to introduce is the notion of a state. So again, you should know from your controls theory that the notion of a state is um, it's sort of almost the most fundamental mathematical quantity when, you, we, when you're trying to model a, a system. So what is the physical state? It's going to be the parameterized state of the physical asset. And um, I'm going to give you examples for an aircraft, but uh, of course, all of the mathematical ideas apply to all those other examples that I was giving earlier. So the physical state is going to be things like the geometry, the structural properties, uh, the engine condition, the actuators. You can imagine this could be a very, very, very long list if you wanted to define an entire aircraft. And you can also imagine that the physical state is going to be very um, multi-scale. Multi so it crosses multiple scales across time and space and also multi-physics and that it's going to draw together many different disciplines. 
We're also going to define the digital state. So the digital state are going to be the parameters or the, the model inputs that define the computational models comprising the digital twin. So uh, in many ways, the digital straight state is going to be our digital abstraction of the physical state. And uh, one of the important and interesting research questions is that we can't possibly model, hope to model absolutely everything in the physical state. So thinking about how we define the digital state in a way that's computationally tractable, but also um, gives us a digital twin that's fit for the purpose we want to use it for. Uh, like I said, I think that's an important and interesting research question. Third, we're going to have the observ observational data. I'm going to call that O. Um, so this is all the information we're going to have describing the state of our physical asset. And the observational data could come from, for example, onboard sensors. So you see here strain gauges on board a wing. Um, they could come from inspection data, could come from flight logs. So any and all different kinds of data you may have that um, tells you something about your physical asset. We're going to have control inputs. Um, so these are actions or decisions that influence the physical asset. And these control inputs might be things where we can uh, make a control to influence the state of the aircraft immediately. So deflecting a control surface to uh, change the way it flies, or they could be uh, inputs that will affect things later. For example, performing a maintenance or performing an inspection, or they could even be a decision to install a sensor in the future so that will influence the data that we'll collect uh, when the aircraft flies in the future. So again, these control inputs can come in a lot of different um, forms. We're going to define quantities of interest. These are things that we can compute or estimate using our, our digital twin models. So this is going to let us uh, predict things like the stress and the strain. So how is the wing going to perform under different conditions? And these quantities of interest are going to be what we use to drive decisions. And we'll formalize that decision task by defining a reward. And the reward quantifies performance. It could include things like um, completing a mission, fuel burn, speed, uh, and, also, and also costs. OK, so these six things are, um, are going to uh, define our digital twin. OK, so I see Aditya has asked a question. How do you keep the digital twin updated in the case of an airplane? Or in any case, how do you keep it live? That's a great question, Aditya. And I'm going to get to that um, actually very, very shortly. In fact, you're going to see it in the, in the, next, in the next slides. And the short answer is um, like very um, powerful mathematical and computational models that let us do that, that updating. All right, so that's that. Those are the elements of the digital twin. Now I'm going to show you how that uh, results in a mathematical model, and um, the mathematical model we're going to build. We're going to start off by building what's called a dynamic Bayesian network. And so in this network, what we're going to do is we're going to um, represent mathematically those different elements, those different quantities I just described. We're going to represent them as random variables. So this S here, this is the physical state of the aircraft. And uh, I am representing it as a random variable. So S0, S1, S2 are the random variable representing here the physical state at different uh, discrete times. And in the dynamic Bayesian network, the transition from one state to another is represented by the conditional probability that you see uh, written here. And uh, I'm being recorded, so I probably shouldn't say this, but I tell you guys, probability and statistics was like the subject I hated the most when I was an undergrad. Um, it just didn't make any sense to me. I still find it really hard, but now I appreciate just what an, an important role it does play in engineering. And you're going to see a lot of um, probability and statistics in, in what I'm showing you here. So even if you don't like it, stick with it. It's really important. Um, okay, so there's the physical state. Here's the digital state, um, the Ds. And again, um, we're representing the digital state with random variables. Now, um, Aditya asked, how do we update the, uh, the digital state? How do we update the digital twin? So now what you can see here is that we can collect observations here, the O, O0, O0, O1, O2, um, from the physical asset. And using those observations, you can solve an inference or a data assimilation problem that says, given uh, the observations, infer the, the, the digital state here. 
Okay, so we're not actually going to try to, um, we, we're sort of representing the physical state as a random variable, but it's the digital state, the representation of the digital state that we'll infer. And again, this is called um, inference or it's called data simulation. This, by the way, is data simulation is what goes on in weather forecasting, right? They have the, the digital state of the weather, they're taking observation data, and then they're solving this uh, data simulation problem to update the estimate of the digital state given, conditioned on, given the observational data. Um, here are the actions. So when we introduce the control actions, now our dynamic Bayesian network becomes a dynamic decision network. And you know, we make these actions that uh, affect the, the state. Here are the quantities of interest, the things that we can compute now with our digital models. And uh, all of that will inform the rewards, which in turn define our, our optimal actions. Okay, so what we're doing here is building, and I'm, I'm showing it to you as a graph. This is a probabilistic graphical model. And again, it's a dynamic decision network. And all the arrows that you've shown here, again, are, um, are conditional probabilities that describe the relationships between the different parts. And what you're gonna see in a second is that the updating task the prediction task and the decision task are now all going to become um, different things that we can do with computational methods that um, are sort of are well established in the in the literature. Before we talk about the methods, I also want to point out that one of the very powerful things about having this digital twin model is that now we can try to predict the future. So of course, here's the current time here in this example, TC equal two, and we only have observational data up until that point but we can use our digital twin to issue predictions about what we might see in the future and then uh, plan out our optimal actions for, for, the, for the future. So we can extend the digital space um, out to the prediction horizon here, TP. And again, mathematically, what is this, this model? This model is a giant um, conditional uh, joint distribution. So it's a joint distribution over the digital states, the quantities of interest, the rewards, the future controls conditioned on given the past observations and the past actions we've taken. And uh, the graphical model encodes a few, um, a few things. And again, these may be terms that are familiar to you, the idea of Markovian dynamics for the physical state and the digital state, which lets um, us sort of deal with, with, with one state at a time. Um, we observe the physical state indirectly and we, we uh, determine the control inputs by the digital twin analysis. And again, I won't be going into too much of the, the gory details, but the general idea is that you can take that model, which as I said, uh, manifests mathematically as uh, this, this joint distribution. You can factor it and you can factor it out into all these different pieces. This term here, the phi dynamics, is the digital state transition. So this is what tells you, given that you're in state dt minus one and you take the action ut minus one, uh, how are you gonna transition to the next state? So this tells you how your model will be evolving. The second term here, the quantity of interest, this encodes the relationship between the digital state and the quantities of interest. So given that this is the state of the wing, what is the maximum stress I might see? That relationship is encoded in here. This uh, evaluation term, uh, again, encodes the relationship between the digital state and the rewards. So given that this is what my system is doing, how well is it performing? The assimilation here, this is uh, what's called the likelihood. This is the relationship between the observed data um, and the digital state. And then the control function here, which is now the, the uh, relationship between the control actions and again, the, the digital state. And maybe what you can also notice is that this control term, this is over the future. So from the current time to the prediction, the assimilation, this is the updating part of it, that's over the past because it's using the past observed data. And then these three terms are both the, uh, the past and the future. So both the current horizon and the, and the prediction horizon. And again, I know these sort of look abstract as um, because I'm writing them as probabilities, but what goes along with each of these things is uh, a set of computational methods that let you actually compute these probabilities and do the digital state updating or determine the optimal control or do the, um, do the predictions of the quantities of interest and, and so on. Okay, so 
Let's see. Is there another question there? How do you prioritize all of these quantities, states, etc.? Since in the case of the physical space, there are infinitely many features which one might store. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, um, so the answer is you got, I'm going to show you how we're doing it, how we've done it for the um, for the UAV example that I'm, I'm about to show you. Um, but in general, I think this is this is a very open research question, and it's a very interesting one because you clearly can't put everything in because if you put everything in and you end up with millions of parameters, the computational methods that I just talked about, um, many of them involve sampling, and if you have too many too too high of a dimension, those problems are, the, the the algorithms will be intractable. So you have to choose that digital state so that it's going to be computationally tractable. But if you leave things out, then will your digital twin replicate what's going on in the real world in order to drive good decisions? And so clearly you have to think about what's the decision you want to make? Uh, how critical is that decision? You know, is somebody's life at risk? How, how much fidelity or confidence do you need to have in it? Uh, what data are you going to have available? And then how will you represent the system? So it's, that's a really a great question. It's not one that, um, I, like I said, I think it's it's still some, somewhat uh, somewhat somewhat open. And I'll show you how we do it in the in the example. All right. So that's just a little uh, just a little peek into the mathematical model. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'll show you how all that plays out for a specific example, and maybe working with the specific example will also help make it a bit clearer what we're doing. So um, the example is a, a unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV, and we're going to build a structural digital twin of that of that vehicle. Um, I'm going to step you through calibrating, so building the digital twin and updating it, and then I'll show you how we can do dynamic estimation of the structural health. So just like Apollo 13 got damaged and they had to update the simulator, our UAV is going to get damaged in flight and we'll update the digital twin and then show how it can be used for, uh, for mission replanning, for driving decisions. And what I'll do is I'll step through these uh, steps and show, talk to you about all the different elements. How do we choose the state? How do we choose the rewards, the observations, quantities of interest, and, and so on? All right. Okay, so um, most of the work in my group is computational, but uh, we also do do a little bit of um, experimental work, especially in this project. And so we have this UAV. It's a customized 12-foot Telemaster aircraft. So uh, my MIT, when I was at MIT, we designed and built this uh, aircraft together with Aurora Flight Sciences. So you can see a picture of it here. This is its first flight in Massachusetts. Uh, the aircraft is now here in Texas with me. Um, and you can see here that this is a, a lab setup. So this is a fuselage mount where we can pop the wings in so that we can do a lot of testing in the lab um, and can get more data than we can get from the flight tests. Uh, we have a custom sensor suite. We have these um, sort of credit card size flexible stickers that we can stick all over the wing and they wirelessly give us dynamic strain and uh, accelerometer data. Um, and I should say because UT's labs, like we were talking about earlier, have been closed, that the wing is actually here in my garage, in my house downstairs. And so I had to recruit my son to help take uh, data. And there, there he is, not very enthusiastically taking data on, on one of the, the scopes. All right. So, um, and, and there's sort of a glimpse at the internal structure of the wing. So um, sitting inside all of those probability distributions I was showing are physics-based models. And this is a really important part of what we do. Um, I don't believe that machine learning and neural networks without physics are ever going to be able to solve these kinds of challenging engineering problems. So we have to build the physics into our digital twin. Here's um, the model we're using. Maybe this will look familiar to you. These are the equations of linear elasticity. I'm sure you've seen these in your classes with the, the um, equation of motion. So it's Newton's second law, uh, the strain displacement equations, and the constitutive equations. Um, all of that goes into a finite element model. You can see here some of the elements of the finite element model. And what you notice is that we're trying to build a model that's a model of this physical wing um, that, we've, that we've got the physical hardware. Um, the finite element model takes about a minute to do one structural analysis, which would be fine if we were only doing one. 
but when we are doing the digital twin updating and quantifying all the uncertainties, we have to do many, many thousands and thousands of runs. So this is really too slow. So we use a reduced order model. And again, this reduced order modeling is a big uh, part of my research group's focus where we uh, come up with surrogates. So models that are simpler and faster, um, in this case, a thousand times faster than the finite element model, but still give very accurate answers and still embed these, uh, these physics. And we work on um, the finite element modeling and the reduced order modeling together with, with Acceler. Okay, um, so back to the question of how to choose the, the digital state. Okay, so I see Sahul asks another question. What currently are the most desirable quantities that have been left out of the digital twin due to the current computational constraints? Yeah, so, so let's talk about the digital state we've chosen. And I think Sahil will, I'll answer your question along the way. Here is the digital state we're gonna work with. And remember we're building a, um, a structural digital twin of this UAV. So we've got um, the parameters in the digital state that you see here. And there are three different flavors of uh, parameters here. So the first is, remember the digital twin is an asset specific model. So we have to include parameters that are gonna capture the variability from my UAV compared to Michael's one, compared to Jordan's one, right? So we've got to have parameters that capture the variability. And that is the vector of geometric parameters. So the geometry is gonna to be to a, to tagged to a specific uh, UAV. The Young's modulus scale factor here, which represents variability in materials, maybe due to manufacturing. And then the structural health parameters, which represent that different UAVs have had different operational lives. And so they're gonna have different degrees of damage and degradation. So geometry, material properties, and structural health are all our parameters that we put in to reflect um, the asset to asset variability that's, that's really central to the digital twin. The second flavor of variable we have are um, variables that capture unmodeled hardware. And in particular, we have this vector of added point masses. And if I go back, you see here, if I can go back, there we go. You see here, here's our nice finite element model of the wing. But then you go back one more and you see here's the actual wing. And you know, what do you see? You see there's all kinds of other stuff on the wing, right? So there's these servo motors, for example, that actuate the ailerons. So now, now you have a choice, right? You can either say, well, I'm gonna create a, a super detailed final element model that represents all of that down to the very last detail of the servo mo mo uh, motors and, and everything else that's on the wing, or, and what we've chosen to do is have a simpler finite element model, but we're gonna introduce these parameters of added point masses that are representing the hardware that we're not modeling. And we're saying, you know what? We don't really need to model the servo mo motors but as long as we capture its effect on the mass, which is going to affect the structural properties of the wing. And as you'll see in a second, we're going to calibrate this. So um, that sort of goes to the question, how do you decide what to leave out? You can leave things out as long as you account for it and then also quantify the uncertainties that come along with it. And then the third uh, flavor is somewhat similar and that's um, parameters that account for mis missing physics. So we're using the linear elasticity for our structural model, which is you know, a really good model for what we want to predict, but it leaves some things out. And in particular, it leaves out the effects of damping. So the Rayleigh damping coefficients, which are widely used in engineering to uh, bring that back in. And again, these are going to be things that we're going to calibrate for the, for the digital twin. All right, we're doing everything uh, probabilistically. So we have uncertainty, all of these states. We don't just have point estimates, but we have estimates of their distributions as well. We have um, uncertain estimates of their uncertainty. We need prior information. And you can see here the prior information that we have on those geometric uh, materials, added mass, and the Rayleigh damping coefficient. So now I'm gonna step you through um, actually building the digital twin and calibrating it. So the first step is gonna to be to calibrate the geometry. So the action, the control action that we take here is measure geometry. That means go out to the wing and get your tape measure or your calipers out and measure the geometry. The observations that you take are the observed geometry. The quantities of interest here are gonna be the, the geometry that we estimate and the reward doesn't really drive much here. Here the reward, this is a measure of, of the, um, 
the change in the digital state from the prior to the posterior. So how much did the estimate of the geometry change after we took the observation? And you could imagine that this might be a measure of how well this UAV is being manufactured. And it might be some information that you might want to feed back into your manufacturing process. So here's the prior, the drawings that we got from Aurora, Aurora's Bright Sciences. There's the observation, go and measure the UAV. And now here's the update, here's the prior. We had Gaussian priors on the geometric parameters, the three that I'm showing here. In this particular case, we can measure um, things like the wingspan and the cord very accurately. So our posterior, our estimate after taking the measurement, we, we don't include any uncertainty in that. We have just a deterministic point estimate. Okay, second step, calibrate the material properties. So we've got E, this is this Young's modulus scale factor. And here we do a load displacement test. So again, the action is to go and do the test. The observations we're gonna collect are pairs of tip displacements. What is a load displacement test? You load the tip of the wing and we mount it upside down and put a load on it, um, a known load, and then we measure the displacement, measure how much the wing displaces. So the observations are the pairs of the load and displacement. The quantities of, of interest here is this aggregate stiffness, which is just the ratio of the load to the displacement. And the reward here is the reduction in variance from, again, prior to posterior. How much do we reduce our uncertainty in the material properties by running this load displacement test? So here you see some of the um, observational data. So these is, this is eight pairs of uh, force displacement uh, data that we've collected from the wing. Um, again, we're modeling uncertainty in everything. So the light blue here, that's the prior. This is what we guess the material properties would be based on the manufacturing specifications. The dark blue is the posterior. This is now our updated estimate, which has a shifted mean and also reduced uncertainty, but it still has some uncertainty in it. Um, again, I'm not going to talk all that much about the computational methods, but um, there are things like kernel density estimation and particle filters are the numerical uh, ways that you do all of this to get these results, to get these distributions that I'm showing there. And again, you might have um, seen some of these things, uh, KDE and particle filters in your, in your classes. And so now um, we've updated the geometry, we've now updated the material parameters, and you can see, uh, again, we're gonna carry forward uncertainty in the material uh, parameters as we go forward. All right, then the last one, we're going to calibrate those point masses and the Rayleigh uh, damping coefficients. This one's my favorite because, um, because this is where signals and systems comes into place. So now it's an initial condition test where you take the wing, you pull up the tip and you let it go, and it oscillates before it settles back to steady state. And you can see here the blue, and I hope when you look at that, you recognize the um, damped oscillatory behavior of a second order system, like you've seen in signals and systems. And it's just always remarkable to me how this complex system like a wing really shows this beautiful, um, this beautiful behavior, just like you saw in the theory where you have the damping ratio that determines the, the envelope of the decay, and then the natural frequencies that determine the, the frequencies of the oscillations. So we can extract from this experimental data um, and fit a model and again, use that to, to come up with our distributions of, of those other parameters. Okay, so now we have a calibrated digital twin, right? We have a digital twin with all those parameters set with their uncertainties for the specific UAV that's uh, here, here with me. We can now take this and uh, take it into the operational phase. And so in the, the operational phase, again, the idea is that the aircraft is flying and while it's flying, something happens to it, uh, maybe it gets hit by something and it undergoes damage. And so now the question is, can we take uh, data from the strain sensors on the wing, take that data, dynamically update the digital twin. So we're gonna update the estimate of the vehicle's uh, structural health and then take the updated digital twin and use it to drive optimal decisions. And in particular, we have to decide, can we keep flying the aggressive flight path, the one here in orange, which gets us uh, to the end faster, but pulls tighter corners, so it puts more load on the wings, which means that then the, the structure is gonna degrade faster. Or do we have to switch to the more conservative flight path 
that takes longer, but it's not gonna load the structure as much. And so that's the, the, the decision. And again, how do you solve that? It's working with this joint distribution and um, using uh, reinforcement learning, dynamic programming, um, sort of pose all that as, a, as an optimal control problem. All right, and uh, this plot here shows um, sort of an example of how that plays out. So you see at the top here, here we're monitoring the structural health parameters. In this case, we're, th this is a simulation, this is not real uh, flight test data. We know what the ground truth is. You can see that we're doing a pretty good job of estimating it, although we have quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, I seem to have lost the, there we go, there it is. We have quite a bit of uncertainty um, in D2, which is this outboard uh, damage here. We're observing strain um, from the different sensors. And then we're using that to drive these controls. So we're starting out flying aggressively. And then at some point, the damage starts to worsen enough that the digital twin says time to switch to the conservative, uh, the more conservative maneuver. And all of that's driven by these reward functions. OK, so hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're doing. And maybe um, some of what you see is um, a lot of the different ingredients that are in the work I've talked about. And those ingredients are really the things that find the field of computational science and engineering, which is there are forward simulations. So there are finite element models that are encoding the physics and are being used to issue the predictions. There's a lot of optimization and in inverse problems. So the inverse problem is the one that says, given the observational data, what is the digital twin state? And then the optimization comes in when we're solving optimization problems to determine the optimal control. You see a lot of uncertainty quantification because we're tracking uncertainty through all of our estimates. And that's really important when we're talking about decisions um, in engineering where, where we literally are involving people's lives. And then you also see a big um, element of scientific machine learning coming into play where we're using um, a lot of the sort of the methods and um, a way of thinking that comes from the, the machine learning world. And we're putting all of these together in a way uh, that I think is is really exciting because it really lets us think about how computational science and engineering can address uh, grand challenges and enable really neat engineering systems. So with that, let me stop. If you're interested in uh, learning more about these things, you can go to my website, kiwi.odin.utexas.edu, and you can see um, some of the papers and, and a bit more about the, the research projects. But let me um, stop sharing so that... I can see your faces again. There we go. And let's see. Oh, what was the website? Sorry. Um, Kiwi.odin. Okay. Uh, ki Kiwi.odin.utexas.eu. But Utex. Utexas, yeah. I'll, I'll oh, pop it in the chat. Yes, please. Yeah. Right, thank you. You can Google me. If you Google me, just make sure that you use two L's in my last name. <laughs> Will do. There we go. So um, I can see Aditya asked another question. Jen, does the digital twin directly control the physical twin using the inputs, or do you usually place a human check in order to make sure the digital twin is taking good decisions? That's another really, really good question. And I think, you know, the answer is digital twins are still kind of in their early stages. And so um, it's, you know, people are still figuring out what's the most effective way to deploy them. If we think back to that Apollo 13 example, the digital twin was informing the humans and the humans were the ones making the decisions. If you think about um, my target application of autonomous, of, of autonomous uh, aerial cargo delivery, so drones delivering packages, you know, at some point in the future, there's gonna be thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these things flying around the cities and the, the, the decision making is going to have to be autonomous. It's going to have to be done by the drones in a way that um, you know, keeps society safe. And so in that example, you can imagine the digital twin is going to be driving decision making um, directly for the drone. So I think you can come up with different, different use cases. But uh, the question of having humans in the loop and how humans and digital twins might work together and also how the digital twin models the effects of a human is again a really interesting and open one because humans are very stochastic systems. I think they're very I think they're even harder to model than turbulent flow, is that right? So another another good question. And you know, to a lot of these really good questions, the answer is um, you know, 
still we need more need more need more research because we're in the early stages of these ideas. Okay, so let's see, Ben is asking, given two very similar assets, is there a more efficient way to do something like digital twin transfer than manual recalibration? Yeah, so that's that's another really good question. So one of the things that is um, is of interest, and we have a, actually a new project, and this is one of the things that we'll be uh, looking at together with Sandia National Labs, is that even though the digital twin is for a particular asset, you could imagine you have a fleet of a thousand of these UAVs that you would want to learn across all of the UAVs. So for example, we talked about the, the material properties maybe varying due to manufacturing variability. Well, you know, of those thousand UAVs, a whole bunch of them will have been manufactured on the same day. And as you start to learn about the material properties of one that can help you inform uh, the material properties of others. And again, the Bayesian statistics, the idea of having a prior and a posterior in doing assimilation of data and updating your belief about the system is a very natural uh, mathematical framework in which to pose those kinds of questions. So I think the answer is absolutely yes. And then to take it even a step further in machine learning, they talk about transfer learning, which is can you learn from data about one system and then somehow take that learning and inferences and use it in a different system. And I think that is also an interesting question, um, you know, as to whether some similar things can be can be done here. Okay, David said, I'm wondering if there's any research on using neural networks to decide how much importance you give to each feature of your digital model when making predictions. Yeah, so as far as I know, um, I don't think anybody has, I, I haven't seen any work that has um, tackled this question of, um, of how to define the digital state. And so, so specifically using neural networks, I, I don't know. Um, you know, like I said, I think it's a really difficult question, but clearly, Again, there's gonna be some kind of a learning where you need to learn what are the important features of the problem. But of course, as well as um, learning in the neural network style, the physics encode a lot of this information, right? In the form of sensitivities. So we know from our physics models that there are certain um, properties of our systems that influence different aspects of their physical, physical behavior. So I think it'll be some combination of machine learning methods and also physics informed um, sensitivities and things that will we'll go into that. Cool, uh, are there any more questions? Oh, was that a hand up? Yeah, go on Jordan. I was gonna ask, so each of the like observations that this digital twin will make or the real thing will make on itself, um, surely if they're taken at like a certain amount of time or they're, dis they're taken at discrete time, there will always be like some amount of information that the digital model doesn't have about or is missing about the actual physical asset. And does that gap in knowledge like mean over time the digital model becomes less accurate or does that not really yeah. matter? Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of facets to an answer to your question. So, I mean, first of all, you guys, have, you've, you've probably seen the Nyquist theorem in your controls class, right? The idea that you need to sample at a certain rate to be able to determine, um, you, you know, and it, 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 it makes very sort of intuitive physical sense that if you don't sample at a certain rate, you can't tell the difference between different frequency behavior because they look the same. And so there is this notion, um, this, first of all, the, the sort of the tied to sampling rate with the Nyquist, with um, the Nyquist criterion. There's um, also the whole question of observability, right? Given, given a certain amount of data, can you infer the, the system state? And again, from a theoretical standpoint, this is long being tackled um, by the controls community, but now it's like we're taking it to a whole nother level. And, um, you know, one question is, is if I am just measuring strain on the surface, can I actually tell what damage has happened to the wing? And the answer is, well, you know, no, it's, the system is not fully observable. But then as an engineer, I repose the question, can I tell what's happened to the wing well enough to be able to make the right decision about how to fly? And the answer to that question might be yes. 
And so then Jordan, your question is about, you asked about temporal resolution and the other part of it is spatial resolution, right? That you could imagine how many sensors do you need on the wing and how much, how, how much time coverage do you need? And um, so, so to, to deal with it, there are kind of two parts. One is a sensor design problem. How many sensors do you need to put on board your system and what resolution do they have to have and how, like what kind of processing rates do they have to have? And how do you trade off getting more data with having more expensive sensors that also on an aircraft are heavy and they consume power? And by the way, consuming power is a huge issue. There's no point having autonomous drones that have got incredible sensors, but the sensors burn up all the batteries so they can't fly. So there's a real design trade-off there. So that's one part of it is the design trade-off. And then the second part is the dynamic sensor allocation problem, which says, you know, your drone's flying around, it got hit. You've got five seconds to make a decision about whether you go left or right around that building you haven't got time to read all the sensor data and process it all, which sensors do you read? And so that's a now a dynamic sensor allocation question. And that's something that Michael has thought about just a little bit, um, but hasn't sort of fully gotten to in his PhD work. So I think it's, that's something for sure we'll be taking on this year. But, um, you know, again, sort of a fascinating question, both from a design standpoint and then also from an operation. And I think, you know, we're quickly getting to the point where we have sort of more data than we can deal with and so then the question is what do we what do we do what's the optimal strategy and maybe just an answer to that i'll mention one other thing which is um the other the other idea that kind of comes into play and i'll draw an analogy here with with humans like you're, you're out running um you're out running in one, one of these mountain trails you're doing the if you're uh, michael's dead you're doing the rim to rim to rim in the grand canyon and you trip and you hurt yourself you fall and you know you, you think you may have broken your ankle or something what's the first thing you do when you get up you put weight on your foot right you put weight on your foot to test out how it feels and that putting of weight on the foot is like a calibration maneuver right it's a known maneuver and you know what to expect so you could imagine you know in this example where the the drone is flying and it gets damaged maybe the very first thing it does is it does a diagnostic maneuver where it takes a, a right turn if it's in a safe space, it takes a right turn at a given radius because it knows what to expect. And by collecting the data that it has, it can look at the difference between what it sees and what it expects. And that difference could be a whole lot more informative than if it just keeps flying. And so again, this is kind of an optimal decision-making problem. Is it worth it to take the time to do the diagnostic maneuver to get better data so that then you can better estimate your state and then drive a better decision? And how does that play into the situation you're in? And again, this is something that we as humans do do naturally. So, so I think that I think that's a really fascinating. The whole sensor question is very very fascinating. One, Aditya, last question. one more. Do you want me to ask answer Aditya's question? You guys need to go. Do you guys need to go and get dinner? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, Adi, well, you can. Um... Yeah, I, I guess I'll just keep it. I'll keep it short. It's basically, um, do you see what what challenges do you see with the whole life cycle of this digital twin? Because it might be created by some company, it'll go into operation with some other, perhaps. So, what sort of challenges do you see with that? I'm just curious. Yeah. yeah. So there are a lot of challenges there, and they're less technical and more sort of organizational, um, because. You know, I mean, obviously there's a lot of issues around sharing information, proprietary information, security, you know, all those things. Um, even how do you, and, and even within one company, you know, the structural, structures group use one set of tools, the CFD, the aero group use a different set of tools. Everybody has their own representation of the geometry. Um, there's been some move towards more model-based engineering processes where there's digital replicas that are shared, but the industry is a long way from doing that. So there's a lot of organizational challenges. And there's um, a sort of a, a sibling concept to digital twin, which is called digital thread. And the digital thread actually is trying to address some of those issues in particular, how do you have a common repository of data that goes across the life cycle of a complex problem project product, especially as it moves from different, like from company to company to different stakeholders. So there's a lot of attention on that question, Aditya, right now. Um, and 
there's a, a lot of challenges, but a lot of them, like I said, are organizational and, and things around proprietary data and, and data pipelines. Thank you. Cool. Uh, well, we'll probably ought to um, wrap it up. Thank you very much for coming. This has been a really good talk. Um, and obviously, because everyone's been asking questions, it's caught everyone's attention. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, That's great. If you had questions and we didn't get to them, then drop me an email. But um, very nice to see you guys and good luck finishing up the semester in these challenging times. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye. See you later.